Today we'll be focusing on acetabular fractures. And uh, typically you can break this up into approaching them from anterior or posterior. Uh, posterior will go from a coker langenbeck approach, and that will be Dr. Giddens will talk about that uh, a little bit later on. Uh, first we're going to talk about an anterior approach. So the classic anterior approach, as described by Letronel, was the ilioinguinal approach. And a lot of modifications uh, have been made from that. Uh, and even before that, people were just using what we call a Smith-Peterson approach. So one thing to remember is a, a lot of these terms, the anatomy doesn't change. The anatomy is the same. And I, and I hope you guys uh, realize that and remember that. And, and in the lab, you'll see that it doesn't matter what you call it. As long as you understand where the anatomy is, you can get to where you're going. Uh, so, you know, I broke this up into what a lot of people call, you know, ilioinguinal. Okay, there's three classic windows there, the lateral, middle, and medial windows. There's the iliofemoral, which is just the same thing as the lateral window, and then extended down through the tensor sheath in between the interval between the tensor and the sartorius. Uh, and then lastly, the stopa, which is really just the medial window of the ilioinguinal, except people cross the table. So you, the surgeon crosses the table to the opposite side is where the fracture is and looks at the quadrilateral surface and posterior column from the other side of the table. So again, the, the names are one thing, but the anatomy is the same. And so for, for my talk, I'm just going to focus on the anterior. Uh, and this is going to be a case example. So just a very basic uh, associated, post, uh, associated both column acetabular fracture. Okay, you see the displacement of the anterior column. You see the keystone triangle fragment there and the displacement of the posterior column. Here are the uh, Jude views, iliac oblique and obturator oblique. Here's the posterior iliac oblique, oblique, which gives you a good view of the posterior column displacement. Okay, so for uh, an associated both column, very classically you'd approach this uh, from a single anterior approach. Okay, and, and for the purposes of our lectures today in our anatomy lab, I'm going to propose to you that majority of uh, acetabular fractures that you need an anterior approach can be dealt with with an ilio iliofemoral and a stopa. So some, uh, some sort of iliac or lateral window, and then some sort of intrapelvic stopa window approach. That'll get you successful treatment of most fractures you're going to see that you're going to have to address from the anterior side, OK? So the iliofemoral, it's just an extended lateral window. We went over yesterday the lateral window, the same thing as we were going over to get to the SI joint. And then depending on how much exposure you need anteriorly to the anterior wall or anterior exposure along the pelvic brim, you can extend that lateral window, which will allow you to displace the psoas more medial. Okay? So skin incision, same thing as we did yesterday. You're just going to extend a second arm down distally over the tensor sheath. Okay? Now the key here is understanding the anatomy of the anterior superior iliac spine. There are three structures that are originating there. There's the sartorius, the tensor is connected there, as well as the inguinal ligament. And the idea is for you to displace the soft tissue medial to give you more exposure, you're going to need to take the inguinal ligament off and the sartorius off in some manner, leaving the tensor to displace the structures medial. Okay. So same, same dissection in the lateral window as we did. Now you can take it off as a sleeve. You can take a soft tissue sleeve of inguinal ligament and sartorius off of the anterior superior iliac spine if you want. Or you can take it off as an osteotomy. And if we have uh, osteotomes, we can practice this in the lab. And the type of osteotomy you can do is, you know, you can just do a single plane cut. You can do a two plane cut. I like to do what's called the step cut that a gentleman, Dr. Keith Mayo, taught me. And it just allows a little bit of a bony block to resist displacement after you're done. So you, see, you can imagine that little step cut there. Once you put that back in, that's going to resist some of the pull of the sartorius to pull you back off. And obviously repair this with screws at the end. But the idea is that you're taking that soft tissue of the inguinal ligament and the sartorius and allowing displacement of the soft tissue as, uh, with the psoas to get you more medial and distal in your exposure. Some people just use the lateral window. Okay, let me go back up here. Just use the lateral window. And if you don't need more anterior medial exposure, you can just do it through this. Some people will have this, and as they need more exposure, they end up just somewhat avulsing the soft tissue off. Not quite as elegant, but it'll get you what you need to do. So 
there's a different, a few different ways to get after this, but the idea is that start with the lateral window, and if you need more exposure, then you can extend that. And that, whether that is through a sleeve that you uh, dissect off or a bone block osteotomy, whatever you prefer. Okay. So distally, uh, you'll. I, I recommend going into the sheath of the tensor. You can traditionally, if you prefer like the Smith-Peterson approach, where you find the true interval between the sartorius and the tensor, it can be a little bit difficult to, to define that interval. But if you incise through the tensor sheath and then trace that muscle belly medial, then you'll know you're truly in that interval. And then you can trace that back up proximally. Because the soft tissue around the anterior superior iliac spine, it's not like these structures have signs on them that says, I am the tissue of the inguinal ligament, I am the tissue of the sartorius, I am the tensor. They all coalesce as you come proximal. So if you start distal and then trace back proximal, it will better define your tissue planes, and we can do that in the lab. One advantage of doing this is that you'll be out of the way, typically out of the way of the lateral femicutaneous nerve. There are some aberrant branches that can come more lateral than expected. Um, and we can talk about that in the lab in terms of how you deal with it. Um, but what this allows, if you extend your lateral window, it allows much more distal and medial exposure. So clamp application, screw application, plate application along the uh, iliopsoas gutter and anterior wall are facilitated in this way. Okay, so that's, that's half of the approach. And for uh, anterior column approaches, uh, that's all you're going to need. Uh, if you have a relatively simple displacement of the quadrilateral surface or posterior column, you may be able to just clamp it through this exposure and do everything from an extended lateral window. If you have a significant amount of displacement from your quadrilateral surface and posterior column, you may want to augment this approach uh, with what's traditionally called a stop a window. Again, this is just if, if you guys have been taught the, the three windows of Letronel, it's, it's the same anatomy. It's just that you cross the table, and it gives you a different surgeon's perspective of what you're going after. Uh, and we had a lot of questions about this uh, yesterday. So regardless of what you call it, uh, we'll go over some of the anatomy. So it's the same exposure um, uh, as we went over, the same initial exposure as we went over for the uh, pubic symphysis yesterday. And this is going to be what the view you have. Do we have the magic wand here? Yeah. So the view you have as a surgeon, you're going to be standing here, and you're going to be looking this way. So you're going to have the perspective of seeing the pelvic brim. You're going to have your assistant lifting up on the external iliac uh, vein, and, and you're going to be working around the obturator system. Here's the corona mortis that we talked about. In the cadavers, it may be uh, a little bit subtle because, obviously, after the uh, um, you know, embalming process or, you know, the processing that they've had, the uh, veins or uh, arteries will not be paint, will not have uh, fluid in them. So we'll have to be kind of elegant in trying to find this. But this is the perspective you have as a surgeon. You can instrument the posterior column. You can put clamps on the posterior column. So it's just a different perspective as the traditional iliowinginal approach. This is what you're going to be able to see from this exposure. Uh, there's one study that thought that it had 80% of the true pelvis. You definitely get a good view of the quadrilateral surface and the pelvic brim. Uh, and I put on there intraarticular views. So in some fractures where you have significant displacement, you will be able to see the femoral head in there. And so if you have some impaction, you may be able to access that impaction from this view. Okay, so it's the same approach as we used yesterday. The difference is that you're going to be dissecting and traveling more lateral. And your ability to do that will depend on how much you dissect the rectus, both off the pubic tubercle. And I think yesterday we probably did more than is typically needed, but it's difficult in a cadaver. And also a proximal split of the rectus. So you need to dissect it proximal as much as you can without getting into the peritoneum to allow you to retract the rectus and, and dissect laterally. Okay, so the corona motor. So we'll try to take a look today, see if we can find them. And if uh, Mike, if your table is able to find it, uh, call us over so we can all look at it. Um, but it's anastomoses from the obturator and the iliac vein uh, or the inferior epigastric. Uh, I will say to you that they're almost always there. Uh, if they're not there, they're either small or they've been avulsed by the fracture. I would say it's the rare patient that I don't find anything. 
And even in those, I, I, I wonder that they were there, but they've been avulsed. Um, and so my rule of thumb is try to see it before it sees you. Uh, and by that, I mean, if you see it, you can dissect and control it uh, very easily, uh, whether you use a hemoclip or a suture or if it's small caliber, just a, just a boviate electrocautery. Um, but if you, if you don't see it or if you miss it, then it can avulse off. And the problem is they're, they're usually not that big a caliber. And even if they are, they're right in your field. And so it's easy enough to control them. What happens though, if you miss them, uh, often what you do is not tear the vessel. You avulse the vessel off one of the arteries or veins. So, uh, you know, you may see, and I'll tell you that there's not just one Sometimes there's multiple, or there may be a vein and an artery. And so you may find a small caliber vein and say, there it is, and you put a clip on it or bovie it, and then you keep dissecting and you don't realize that there's a second anastomosis. And that gets a full stop, the iliac vein or the obturator. So that's where I think people have gotten into trouble because if you were to go in and just cut that, yes, it'll bleed, but it won't be that catastrophic typically. So usually the problem is when you avulse it off. So the rule of thumb, try to see it before it sees you. If you find something small or you find one, don't be surprised if there's another one. So just keep looking back. And the trick to, not the trick, but the, I think the one learning point is understanding the trajectory that they're in. So when you have this perspective in here, they really are the only thing that's going vertical in the field. So if there's a soft tissue structure that's somewhat vertical in your exposure, be very suspicious about that being a vessel. All right. And I'm sure that, you know, when I was first starting out doing this, I probably clipped or put ties on things that were unnecessary, but that's better than cutting things and having bleeding in your field. Okay, so we've controlled the corona mortis. Any questions on that before I keep going? We had some questions yesterday. Okay, uh, so once you control that, you're going to continue to dissect along lateral. Uh, obviously, you're going to want to identify your obturator neurovascular system, uh, and as you dissect along, you're going to keep going along the pelvic brim. Uh, the iliopectineal fascia will be there, and if you have a significantly displaced anterior column, it can be a little bit confusing as to where you are, but I would definitely encourage you to take your time as you dissect laterally and posteriorly, okay? Uh, you can go all the way back to the SI joint. Now, that fascia, that iliopectineal fascia will be confusing to you because you'll be like, what is this, especially if it's two weeks out? But as in any other surgery, gentle, gentle blunt dissection, the true tissue planes will define themselves. Okay. Uh, things I've seen in the field, I've seen hernias, I've seen testicles that have reascended up into my field. Uh, I've seen obturator uh, arteries and veins that have been disrupted by the injury. And then when I get in and dissect, they open back up again. Um, so I always have uh, uh, small hemoclips on the field or tie, surgical ties if you prefer that at the ready so that you're uh, ready for it. And if, and if you can't, you know, get control, you can't have, uh, you don't see good access for it, just pack it for 10 minutes and then open back up and see if you can identify it. So, okay, this is a picture of the obturator neurovascular bundle. So as opposed to, so uh, imagine this is the left side of the patient. This is kind of a confusing picture. Left side of the patient I'm on the right side of the patient. The corona mortis was vertical. We controlled that. And then the obturators are going to be running horizontal. Okay. And typically I'll work on both sides of the obturator neurovascular bundle. As I'm dissecting around, you have your malleable protecting your bladder, dissecting posterior and laterally. Uh, and then when I need to work on the quadrilateral surface, I'll put the retractor over the obturator neurovascular bundle. Okay, here's a couple other pictures of it. As like I said, you have good vi visualization of the quadrilateral surface, and you can get all the way back to the SI joint. Obviously, the uh, gluteals are back there, so be careful of uh, any retractor placement and sustained retractor placement as well. You can get sciatic nerve palsies uh, from uh, retracting. Placing your retractor back here, Adjacent to the SI joint, adjacent to the greater sciatic notch, you can give people uh, temporary sciatic nerve palsies. Okay, so let's go back to the case example. Uh, we identified it as a very simple associated both column. We decided we want to go an anterior approach for this, okay? And uh, for me, you know, an, an iliofemoral, I'll be able to get access to this anterior column piece. The posterior column had significant displacement. So, 
If you're not comfortable with the stop approach, you can still uh, gain clamp access with you know one tine of the clamp on the quadrilateral surface and one tine of the clamp on the intact ilium. But if you're comfortable with the stoppa and are exploring this, uh, this type of pattern, uh, I think is advantageous, or a stoppa approach is advantageous for this type of pattern with this amount of posterior column disruption. One thing that can help a lot is placing a chance pin in the femoral neck. Um, I think this was an intro picture. Usually send this up deeper in the neck. If you have poor bone quality or if this rips out, put it across into the lesser, obviously above the lesser, so you don't create a stress riser for a subtrochanteric fracture. Okay, that will help you with the displacement of the femoral head. Some people attach this to the table. Other people, just if you don't have that, just have your assistant holding it while you need it. Okay, so you can see how much that affects the reduction just with pulling lateral traction there. Okay, typically we'll start uh, with the anterior column. Uh, things that are simple things that will help, uh, a chance pin in the gluteus medius pillar, the anterior column, so that you can rotate uh, the anterior column back. Uh, you can clamp just a simple Weber clamp, simple point of reduction clamp on the crest. And uh, also two millimeter screws can be put in provisionally uh, just to hold things in place. So simple things that uh, I'm pretty confident you guys have access to that can help you with your reduction. Uh, and then if you move to the stop a window, you can place it, whether you want to clamp through it or whether you want to put a buttress plate through it. I just, in this example, just a, a simple buttress plate there. And you see I've reestablished the ilioischial line there just with a simple buttress plate there. So that's, you know, that plate is essentially working as a clamp right now. Okay. And then you can plate your anterior column, provide fixation into your uh, posterior column with your uh, drop down screws and provide fixation of your anterior column um, uh, in addition with an LC2 screw. So you guys learned how to do this yesterday. Uh, you already knew, some of you already knew how to do it, but this is the same as the external fixator. So if you ask, how do I put that screw in? I usually do it, you know, um, kind of eyeballing it, but if you have access to fluoroscopy, uh, you use the same views as you did with the external fixator that we went over yesterday. Okay, so here's our final construct. So simple pattern, Two simple approaches, nothing fancy with this. Uh, just uh, basic reduction clamps, basic re reconstruction uh, plates, and basic 3.5 screws. And here are the two views here. <laughs>